Good evening and welcome to another session of our legal clinic with Arthur Bergeron. Um, today he's going to be talking about knowing about the quali and qualifying for government benefits. And um, I'd like to thank Arthur once again for coming. And, and Joyce for inviting me. And Joyce, for, we've been doing this together for a long time. A long time, yes. Yeah. So without any further ado, welcome Arthur. Thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you all for coming. I hope there's enough seats for everybody. I think there's there are a couple. There's one extra seat up front here. Thank you for all for coming. And let me start off by saying, um, I always say at the offices, you know, every day in Martha's Vineyard is better than a beautiful day at the office. Um, but that said, this was a beautiful day at Martha's Vineyard. What a wonderful day! And I want to say, kind of congratulations to you all that. The Warren articles that dealt with the Center for Living project, as, as well as a number of other things, everything passed, it's my understanding. This is just unbelievably good, as far as I'm concerned, from the perspective of the folks that I deal with here. And I think Martha's Vineyard is really positioned to be kind of the leader in explaining to a lot of people all around Massachusetts how you figure out how to, how to give folks the opportunity to really live a happy life until they die wherever they are, which is really a wonderful, just a wonderful thing. So congratulations. Um, so this is part two of the, of the series that we're doing here this spring. As I had mentioned when I did uh, Elder Law 101, I decided that at the first two presentations this year, I would try to do a, a topics of real general interest. So there's a lot of information here. So I'm, I'm no, I normally talk so slow, but they might be kind of fast. We might be talking, there's a lot of stuff. And then for the fall, I'm going to do kind of two more specific presentations on specific areas. And I'm still open on what those are, so that if you have particular areas that you think might be of interest, that are kind of a cluster of elder law concerns, I'd like to know about that. And we may use it as a presentation. So the Elder Law 101 we talked about, so you, what happens when you're slowing down? You know, when you're retiring and you kind of know, you know you're not going to be earning a lot more money. Um, and you're going to kind of be living on what you've got and you're trying to figure out what you need in terms of documents. And we talked about all those things. Today, Elder Law two, or 102, we're going to talk about the things that you are eligible for, the things that might really help you as an elder um, to continue to live your life until you die and be happy. And there are actually a lot of those things. Now, you know my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I'm always going to play, talk about it as it relates to these folks. You've met them before. Um, they have very simple goals. They want to die and be buried in the backyard. If one of them dies, they want to leave everything to their spouse, all things equal. equal. And when the two of them have died, they'd like to get everything to re that's left divided up among the kids. So that's the basic plan. And their goal during their lifetimes is, as I said, they want to die and be buried in the backyard. And there are their assets. Uh, their house is not real expensive. It's three hundred thousand dollars. They have an IRA worth one seventy, an annuity worth a hundred, bank accounts worth eighty. So they've got total assets of six hundred fifty thousand dollars. So their house is a little less than the houses here, but not by a tremendous amount for a lot of the houses. Um, and their income, Frank's income, is from Social Security. He earns two thousand. He earns fifteen hundred a month from Social Security, and he has a five hundred dollar pension. So he's getting 2,000 total, and, and Mary is getting half of Frank's Social Security, or 750. So they're doing okay. They're making about $30,000 a year. They've got no mortgage, so they're going to be all right, right? And so, but one of their goals is, you know, they're they're still fairly young. They're 70, and they're trying to make sure that you know they know things could come up, and they don't want to run out of money uh, before they die, and that's one of their goals. And they really want to stay in their house. So there there are two kind of pieces of that. One is how do you make sure that you take care of the house? And then two is how do you take care of Frank and Mary? So we're going to talk about both of those things and some tools that may be available that you may know about that will help them do those two things. So first, if you want to stay in the house, I always tell my clients who are getting older, that is a great goal and probably the happiest place you could be because it's the place where no matter how bad things get and how forgetful you get, you're always going to know where the bathroom is in your own house, you know, and where the salt and pepper are and stuff like that. So it's a great goal, but you have to make sure you're safe. So as you're getting older, it may be that some of the things about the house have to change 
in order for you to stay in that house. There may have to be some kind of significant repairs that you need, not necessarily repairs, but just modifications. And as a matter of fact, I think I've had um, Carol DiRienzo come here once. She, was, she always refers to herself as the nurse carpenter. She and her husband have a business, and that's all they do, is they'll actually go to your house, you know, and kind of go through your house if you're older, and try to suggest to you some modifications that can be made. It's kind of like, you know, beyond the, 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 uh, just the little ramp outside. There are so many things that can be done to reduce especially your chance of falling. Because as I always talk to my elder clients and say, you know, you just, you know, you can live to be a very ripe old age, but don't break your hip. You know, you know where that goes. You break your hip, it kind of only goes in one direction. So you want to make it really safe. But then the question, if you're Frank and Mary, is how do you pay for that? Because they don't have the income that's going to support paying for it. They don't want to take out another mortgage and have another payment, right? So I'm going to talk about paying for home improvements a little bit, right? Because there are three ways for doing it. Now, you're all aware of one of them, and that's the reverse mortgage. Oh, no, not a reverse mortgage, right? I'll never take out a reverse mortgage. Don't, you know, don't you have to pay that back? Well, yeah, you do, you know. And so nobody is crazy about taking out a reverse mortgage. But if you're Frank and Mary, and you want to stay in your house, and you want to fix it up, right? And your goal is to stay in the house until you die. Well, you don't want to say, in order to, because I'm not willing to take out a reverse mortgage, I'm going to get rid of the house. I mean, the whole point of your life was to stay in your house, right? So if you need it, you, you may need it. So first I want to talk about it. I want to talk about three kinds of reverse mortgages. One, that the state will give you. It's called the Home Modification Program. Have any, anybody here heard of that or used it? Can you raise your hands? No? So if you have a disability, uh, in, in the opinion of the people writing the mortgages and the disabilities, Mass Disabilities Commission, and they have a very generous view of what a disability is. If you have a disability and you've gone through the house and there are some things that you could do in order to improve your house to make it safer given the fact that you have this disability, whether it's that kind of you know, greater pension for falling or you've got some kind of other issues, well, in that case, the state will actually lend you up to $30,000 to make those modifications. And they'll charge you either no interest or they'll charge you a very low interest. And the terms of the loan are, as I say, it's very low or no interest, no payments. It's due when the loan is due when you sell the house or when you die. So it's exactly like a reverse mortgage. It is a reverse mortgage, but it's given to you by the Commonwealth. Now, then the question is, well, you know, how poor do you have to be in order to get a zero interest loan? Because that's a very attractive rate, right? Well, if you're a, there's a, they have a chart on this, but just I pulled out some numbers. If you're a family of two, if you're Frank and Mary, your income can be up to $78,800. That's your joint income. That's pretty high. This isn't like poverty level, right? A lot of people that I know have incomes of less than that, especially after you're retired, right? And if you were, and to qualify for the 3%, your income has to be below $157,600 a year. Well, boy, that covers a lot of people too, right? So I guess I'm just suggesting to you there are a lot of people, $30,000 isn't an infinite amount. It's not going to put in the elevator, you know, but it's going to do a lot of work, a lot of work around your house. So that's kind of reverse mortgage number one. Reverse mortgage number two, of course, is what you always think of as a reverse mortgage. So I'm just going to talk about that for a few minutes. Now, once again, I never recommend these for folks who are trying to live on them. People who are getting re are retired and they're kind of bummed out because their income is going down. And they, don't, and, and, and they don't have enough savings to kind of maintain their style of living, and so they say, oh, I'll take a reverse mortgage. That's a dangerous road. I know some people on Martha's Vineyard that have gone down that road. That's a dangerous road. Because um, you, you run out of the time when that extra payment is coming, and now what, you know? Or the house expenses have gone up or, or, or whatever, right? And then you're kind of needing to sell the house, except now there's no place to go because you've eaten up, you have eaten up a lot of the equity. So, but on the other hand, if you're Frank and Mary, and you're really getting older, and you're not trying to live on this money, but you're simply trying to fix up the house or make it so that you can continue to live there, that's the right time to think about it. So how do reverse mortgages work? Um, you have to be 62 or older. And if you're Frank and Mary, you both have to be 62 or older, right? The amount that they will give you is based on two things, the value of your house. Not surprisingly, it's a mortgage. So it's a percentage of the value, but also on your age they will give you an increasing percentage of the value of your house 
uh, depending on the older you get, right? Um, by the way, there is a cap. This is, this is not relevant in most of the world, but in Martha's Vineyard it is. There's a cap on the value that they will use no matter what your house is worth. That cap is now about between $625,000 and $650,000, right? So if you have a million dollar house, they're still going to base the amount they'll give you as a percentage of that cap number, say the, the $650,000 number. Now, the way I tell people to use these is to use them as a line of credit, right? So don't take out a reverse mortgage, take all the money and simply pull it out and put it in your bank, right? When, when reverse mortgages first got popularized, maybe 30 years ago, when the, the, the only reason why, by the way, any banks are in this business is because the federal government insures these. So that if at the end of the day, when you die, there's more owed on the house than there is value in the house, the bank never loses. The federal government at that point pays the, pays the extra, right? So a piece of this program is you're basically buying, putting some money into an insurance pool that will do that, right? So that's why banks do it. And, and be, but because the banks are getting this guarantee, these are also very heavily federally regulated. So you may hear an ad for one company or another or see something on TV. Like you can look around, but trust me, they're like really the same. I mean, if you look from company to company, the rates tend to be the same, the amounts are tend to be the same because they're all fed, it's all based on the federal regulation. So use it as a line of credit. It, once again, early on these thing, when these things were being done, there were some fairly unscrupulous reverse mortgage salesmen who were kind of going and saying to people, well, you know, you're not getting a very good investment. You know, you're not getting a good return right now on your other investments. What you ought to do is just take out a reverse mortgage and just pull all the money out and give it to me. I mean, uh, <laughs> buy an annuity, right? And here's this terrific annuity, and it's going to do this and that and blah, 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 and read the fine print. And so a lot of people got killed that way because they just, you know, the re annuities made virtually nothing and the money was all gone. But once again, if you simply use it as a line of credit, so you get the reverse mortgage set up and you just pull out, if you're Frank and Mary, the amount that it's going to take you to fix up your house. And you leave everything else in there and then the interest that is accruing on the reverse mortgage is simply accruing on that small amount, the amount that you took out in order to fix out your house, right? Because so that's kind of how it works. One other thing, though, about reverse mortgages, you can always, if you don't want the amount that is owed on the house to grow, you can always make the payments. You know, it isn't like you can't make the monthly interest payments, right? It's just that if you don't, you don't have to. So people will always say, well, why would I want to do this? I've got a line of credit with the bank. Well, the reason why you don't want, you want to do this is because you got to make a payment on the line of credit at the bank. And if you don't, right, there's a foreclosure problem, right? Whereas these, you don't. You can always make it if you want, but you don't have to. So. If you're Frank and Mary, um, and you've got that house worth $300,000, then the amount that you can get out immediately in a reverse mortgage if you're 70 years old is $103,000. The amount that you can get out in total, um, the rest of the money is available after the first year is $167,000. Current interest rates, these are all adjustable. So I'm just using, this, was, this information is like 40 days old. So when I looked in the book to see what was, what people were charging, that was the rate, 3.7%, which is about the same that you'd pay right now on an adjustable rate mortgage. Um, and, the, and by the way, the other thing that people always say, the great fear about these things is, yeah, but isn't it a killer? Aren't the financing charges murder, the upfront costs? Well, that's the current figure, $4,062. Now, that number three years ago was about $12,000. Right? But there's been all this competition in the market. There's been a lot more people coming into this market, and so the costs have gone way, way down. Right? So if you're Frank and Mary, you would borrow that, the $4,062, so you're not taking it out of your savings, plus whatever it would take to fix up the house. If Frank and Mary were 80, once again, the, the, the amount that they could take out would be greater. It goes up to 118000 but not a lot greater. Right? And the total goes, goes up by about 30000 to 192000 So. Once again, it is not the, pre it, it, you don't do it unless you need to do it. But if you're Frank and Mary and you want to maintain the house, this may be something that you really want to think about doing. Finally, there is tax deferral. Um, to, to, and this is basically your town giving you a reverse mortgage, right? Uh, if you are 62 years of older and, or older and you've lived in your house, I believe it's more than five years. I don't even think it's your house. I think it's the, if you've lived in the town more than five years. Um, you, are, you may go to the assessor's office, no matter how much you have in assets, 
and say, I don't want to pay my taxes this year. I want to defer them. And they have to say yes. This isn't one of those that you go and they, you know, wait for the decision. They have to say yes, right? And according to the state, this is a state law. It's called General Laws Chapter 59, Section 5, Clause 41st A. Who, this, that's real trivia. You don't have to know that. Just go to the assessor's office, tell them you want to defer your taxes. Um, but according to the state law, there's no asset limit. There is a state income limit of $20,000 a year, right, for Frank and Mary. And that's not a lot. So Frank and Mary couldn't do it if you're only using the state limit. And there's a state interest rate of 8%. The, the town has to charge you 8%. Unless, and I really want to emphasize this because this is Martha's Vineyard, unless town meeting votes something else. Town meeting, the town has the right to increase this, in, this income level to as high as, I know it's at least $55,000, because I know a town where it is $55,000 in Ashland, right? So that you could qualify for this deferral if you may earn as much as $55,000 a year. And they can reduce the interest rate to as low as zero. That is totally in the discretion of town meeting. Right? And I mention that because, because for a lot of people that I talk to, their, their tax bill in this situation is many, one of their biggest bills. I just talked to somebody today, and so what did they got? They had, I think, I think one was like, it was a gov had a government, maybe it was a, one was a teacher and one was doing something. Um, and so their incomes are pretty good, right? Um, but they've got their house and they don't have a lot of savings, right? And their tax bill is one of their biggest bills. So that if they had the ability, and they're older folks, you know, and they don't want to move, who wants to move? Who wants to move from Martha's Vineyard? Give me a break, you know. So they don't want to move. And where are they going to move to in Martha's Vineyard? You know, I mean, there is no assisted living. There's a little bit of elderly housing, you know. So for them, but, but they, they can't meet the income threshold. They can't meet the income threshold. So I told them, I said, you know, you may want to talk to some of your friends. I mean, how many people go to town meeting, right? You know, 50% plus one, and this number could really change. And I think here, especially where the house values are so high compared to a lot of people's incomes, this could really help a lot of people. But even now, if you meet those criteria, you can permanently defer. You, you have to apply for it every year, but you can permanently defer all of your taxes. So, once again, the town can modify. When I did this slide, I thought the maximum was $40,000. And then I discovered the town that was doing 55. So I, it, it made, it, I, I was wrong on that, right? And, and, by the way, because of the way the Massachusetts statute is written, you can do this and at the same time have a reverse mortgage, right? Um, for reasons I won't go into. It gets a little complicated. So you can really get rid of, so that you can not only kind of take care of fixing up the house, but also really kind of dramatically reduce your cost of running the house. So then, so that's the house. So then, how do we take care of Frank and Mary so that they can stay at home in the house? The first thing that they would, Frank and Mary would want to do I've talked about this many times before, but you want to call them. Call Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands. They are your tax dollars at work, right? This is an organization. They cover all of the Cape and all of the islands, hence the name. Um, and they are there to basically tell you all of the programs that you are eligible for, right, that are being paid for with either state or federal money. That's their job, right? And they're very interested in this, right? They, they, there's some great people here just, just doing this. So there's the contact information. You'll, they'll tell you, they, they are the, it's the, they're called Aging Services Access Points. There are 27 of these in the state. Each one has its own region. So Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Island has this region. Um, they will tell they, they're the ones that are in charge of all of the basic things. Meals on Wheels was created at the same time as the ASAPs. This was all part of the so-called the Older Americans Act, passed back when we were all young. LBJ passed the Older Americans Act, right? Lyndon Johnson. So it was Meals on Wheels Lifeline, right? They'll help you subsidize the cost of having a lifeline. My wife and I were recently in, uh, in Texas visiting her sister when she had a seizure. She lives by herself in a condo. She would have just been dead. I mean, if we hadn't been there, she, she has a lifeline, one of those little things that you have a little button, right? Didn't have it on. She would have been dead, right? We just happened to be there. So Lifeline, for a lot of folks who are single living in their house, it, that's what's going to save you. And they'll help you pay for that. They'll give you advice on a ton of other, other benefits. And I'm just going to talk about one set, which is probably the most common thing that people ask about, other than Meals on Wheels and stuff. 
and that's home care. So you're entitled to a lot of benefits under Mass Health if you meet certain criteria. But it, but even if you just, you don't necessarily need help with one of with the activities of daily living. You know, you don't need a lot of help with dressing and bathing and other stuff. You just need a little help around the house. Maybe somebody who will cook a meal. Somebody who will help go do some grocery shopping, do some basic stuff. That's why they call it basic. There is a program that they run, and I think the name of it is actually called Basic. Um, and then there's a more advanced one called ECOP, and I don't know what that stands for either. I'm sorry, I just I don't know. Uh, but both of those programs will give you home care in your home on a weekly basis. Basic will provide up to six hours a week. ECOP will provide up to 12 hours a week, right? So if and they will and you will be charged a copay depending on what your income is. And I know you can't read these numbers on the screen, but they're in your handout. But just to tell you. Frank and Mary, on their income, would pay a maximum copay of $103 a month. Now, this is for, remember, up to 12 hours of care, of home care a week. So that's 12 times 4 weeks in a month is 48, so round to 50. So it's, a, it's four, 50 hours of home care. If you're paying for an agency to do that, figure you're paying $20 to $25 an hour. Actually, that's back in America. I think it's higher. I think, I think it's higher to here, yeah. But at 25 to 20 to 25, 50 hours times $20 is $1,000. 50 times 25 is 1250. 50 times 30 would be $1,500 a month. Your copay is $103. That's a great deal. These are state tax dollars. Your state tax dollars at work. Um, there are no so there are no asset requirements regarding this program. Only this income copay. Right? So it's a big deal if you're Frank and Mary and you're, you're and you're starting to need some services. The other great thing about that is that through this, this program, you like introduce yourselves to the folks from Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands, so that then they're talking to you because they've got social workers who will come and see you. They'll stop by the house. They've got nurses. They've got case managers who will help you figure out if there are some other things that you need. So they're really, really your friends. And interestingly, while, while most places, maybe I'll talk about this a little later on, but this. The, one of the unusual things about the Center for Living is that the Center for Living, as you, many of you know, probably provi basically provides a so-called social day program, a program for folks who are frail or who have early stages of dementia, right? Um, but a kind of a place to be, a place to be during the day and socialize and stuff so it's helpful for them, it's helpful for care managers. But in most places, that is not paid for by the state by the state. But it is my understanding that here it is, that they actually, they, they get support from uh, Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands to do this. Yeah, right? partially. Part, it's partially paid for. Yes. Ah, so it's pa partially paid by the town. That's right. That's right. And then they get state money. And then if you're on Mass Health, usually if you're on Mass Health, they won't pay for a supportive day program. They'll only pay for a so-called medical model yes. day program. But here they'll pay for it. Here they'll pay for it. I don't, I, I don't know how they do that. Is it, right, right. So it's, once again, it's, an, it's an, just an example. It's just another one of those unusual cases where Martha's Vineyard's really been kind of ahead of the curve in terms of it involved in doing stuff. Finally, there is the so-called Community Choices Program, which is the Frail Elder Waiver Program. So the Frail Elder Waiver Program is designed if you need quite a bit of care, right? If you are otherwise eligible for nursing home care. Now, you would say to yourselves, well, you know, I've got to be pretty sick to be eligible to go to a nursing home, right? And, and in your own mind, you say, well, yeah, that's when you'd go. But the, the standard is quite a bit lower than, lower than your standard. The state standard is, much, is lower than your standard. The standard to qualify for having mass health pay for you to go to a nursing home is that you need to have need assistance regularly with at least two of the activities of daily living. And I mentioned those. They are dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, and transferring. What is transferring? Getting up out of a chair, walking across the room, sitting down. You need to need help with at least two of those, or you need to, to require regular supervision because you've got dementia, because otherwise you really kind of could be a danger to yourself, right? If in either of those cases, if you're medically eligible for, for that from nursing home care, you're also eligible for a program called the Frail Elder Waiver, or the FEW, or F-E-W. Through that program, 
whatever number of home care hours you need in order to stay home and not go to the nursing home, whatever number of hours, who, who decides on this? It's, it's Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands, of all things. Whatever number of hours they say you need in order to stay home, Mass Health will pay for. Now, then the question is, so that, that's as long as you're medically eligible, and I gave you that standard, and if you're financially eligible. So we're going to talk, so once again, you need to have at least require assistance with two of the activities of daily living or need that kind of skilled care uh, because you need supervision, right? I'm going to talk about that one a little bit more later on, but I'm going to mention one other thing. Aid in attendance, the aid in attendance benefit. Once again, when you are at home, if you need assistance with at least one activity of daily living, one out of the five, and one of you, either Frank or Mary, or if Mary's a widow, Frank, you know, Frank was, a, she's a widow of Frank. If one of you served in the active military service for 90 days, and if at least one of those days was in a per during a period of war, then you are entitled to a benefit called the aid and attendance benefit. And I just draw your attention to the years when the most two, the two most relevant wars, at least to this point, occurred. World War II ended December 31st, 1946. But wait, didn't the bomb get dropped in August of 1945, right? So many people have, don't know they're entitled to this benefit because they don't realize when the war ended, right? Similarly, Korea ended January 31st, 1955, even though Eisenhower was elected in 52 and basically Korea kind of ended in 53. But you're eligible up to that date. I just had someone, once again, who just found out that he was eligible, right? Which is a big deal for him. If you are eligible, um, there is an asset limit to this program, um, but it is not, if you, if you are a veteran and you've heard about this program, you've probably heard that the asset limit is $80,000. That is incorrect. It is, it is whatever the VA determines you need in order to live the rest of your life at home, which can be substantially more than $80,000. And even if you're over that number, you can actually gift a lot of that money away. It used to be that there was no look back regarding gifting, and I think that's still in effect. And finally, for folks who are over the limit, but they, but they are just by a little bit, or even can buy quite a bit, you can also get under the limit by simply taking some of that money and turning it into an annuity, a monthly income stream. If you do that, then you can qualify for the benefit. Once again, this is kind of an overview, so you want to talk to somebody who does, that, you know, if you need a name, I can get you a name. We don't do this, right? We have just specialists that we refer people to who just do this. Um, the potential benefit for Frank and, if Frank and Mary are both still at home, is, is $1,600 a month at home to supplement their income, which is a big deal if their income is only like $2,700. Uh, or for Mary, if Frank, if Frank has died, it's $880. Finally, MassHealth 101. I was just mentioning the Frail Elder Waiver, and I'm going to refer to that a little bit more here. MassHealth 101. So, um, back to these numbers. You've seen those numbers before. Frank and Mary have a house. He's got an IRA, they've got an annuity, they've got bank accounts. If Mary needs to go to a nursing home, and I'm sorry if some of you folks have been here before, then you've heard this, you may have heard this before, but remember, a lot of these presentations are for the folks who aren't here. That's why Tom is kind enough to do the, the, the videoing and the cable is kind enough to rebroadcast. It's like the person who can't get here because they're taking care of their husband at home, among other things, right? So if Mary needs to go to a nursing home, then she does not have to, neither of them have to spend any money down on that nursing home at this point, right? While, while she could not qualify for Medicare for more than 100 days in that nursing home, once she was beyond that 100 days, she could qualify for MassHealth. She could qualify for MassHealth right away, even though MassHealth is meant to cover poor people. And the reason is that for MassHealth purposes, she has to be poor, but Frank doesn't, right? So she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank, as the spouse at home, can own the home as long as it has a value, an a, a, a equity of less than $820,000 approximately, right? And by the way, if the equity is over that, um, basically what I recommend to people is go get a reverse mortgage, pull some of it out, right? So that you get the equity down to that right number. Um, he can have cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220 in addition to the home, but obviously he's over those numbers, right? But he can also have unlimited income, unlimited income. So, so if Mary needs nursing home care, even if they've done no planning in advance, no planning, 
she can immediately transfer her interest in the house to Frank and all of the money provided, and this goes back to Elder Law 101, provided that someone has Mary's power of attorney so that Mary can, somebody can sign things for Mary because otherwise Mary's stuck and so is Frank. That's why the most important document you can have is not a will but a power of attorney. Right? Um, so she can transfer all the assets to Frank and then Frank, if his assets are over that magic number, can simply go buy an annuity of a very specific kind. Many of you may have annuities, but they're not this kind. Many of you have things that are called annuities, but they're really just kind of like big accounts that you have. And you're earning interest on them, and you can pull out the money at any time. That's not this kind of annuity. You need to buy, Frank would need to buy an annuity for a fixed term, and, the, and it has to say that during that term, he's going to get monthly payments, and those monthly payments have to be for a term that does not exceed his actuarial life expectancy. If Frank is 80 years old, his life expectancy at that point is probably about eight years, right? It's surprising. If Frank were 100, his life expectancy would be a year and a half, actually. Um, so at any age, this works, right? So Frank can always qualify Mary for mass health right away by simply having everything shipped to Frank and then have Frank buy an annuity. Um, the only thing that Frank may also want to do if he wants to protect Mary is to make sure that if he dies, he doesn't leave everything to Mary. Because remember, that was their original plan. Their plan was if one dies, they're going to leave everything to the other. If he does that and Mary needs nursing home care, she's got a problem, right? Because now she's got all these assets, right? And she's got to spend down all the cash until it's below $2,000. At that point, Mary would qualify for mass health because the house isn't considered countable as long as she says she's going to return to it, um, which is why, in general, when you're filling out your mass health application, you even no matter how sick you are, right, whoever's filling out that form should be saying that you intend to return home, because otherwise you have to sell the house. But regarding that house, they will put a lien on the house to get paid back, mass health will, after you die. So, so Frank can protect those assets, whether he is alive or dead, even though Mary is in the nursing home. The only problem is, what if Frank has died before they did any of that, and Mary now owns all the assets, and now she needs nursing home care? Well, in that case, she has a problem, right? And Because with those assets, she'd need to spend down, once again, all that cash until she just got to the house, and then MassHealth would have her pay her Social Security check to the nursing home. MassHealth would pay the difference between that and the nursing home bill, uh, and, Mary, and they would put a lien on the, on the house. Um, and that's... And that's a problem. There aren't a lot of things that Mary can do, but this is the one place, the one and only place, where the only thing that Mary can do is give things away and wait five years. Give things away, that's the famous five-year look-back period that you've all heard about. It does not apply to transfers between spouses. It does apply to gifts to children. Now, often people will say at that point, well, what you should be doing is giving everything away to creating an irrevocable trust and giving everything away to the irrevocable trust. Actually, um, in, in many cases, the simpler thing to do is to simply give things to your children. Um, because if you're giving them to an irrevocable trust, then you can't get them back anyway. So you may just want to give them to your children. There may be some reasons to not do that. There are some tax reasons that you may, may not want to do that, but that's kind of beyond the scope. But that's the issue if you're just married. You actually have to give things away. Don't, just kind of one cautionary note, don't Put money, don't, if you're married, create an irrevocable trust and put money into the irrevocable trust. Th those, those kinds of assets in irrevocable trusts are being challenged more and more by mass health, so we never advise that. If you've got cash that you're trying to shield, what you want to do is give it to your children and have your children create a trust so that when you're later reporting that transfer to mass health, you're not saying anything about a trust and therefore not having to provide a copy of the trust, because you just made a gift to your kids. Um, don't set up your own irrevocable trust and put money into it. Just a couple more things. Uh, a word about long-term care insurance. As I just went through with you, Frank and Mary really don't need long-term care insurance. I talked about this when I was in doing Elder Law 101, because if one of them needs nursing home, they can shift everything to the other. And when, if that one dies, then they can put everything in trust. So, those people really don't need long-term care insurance kind of in general, right? Mary could use some long-term care insurance, right? If Frank has died and Mary has inherited everything, because otherwise she's going to have to spend down a lot of assets, right? But may not, 
be able to afford it because it would take a big long-term care insurance policy to cover a, an extended stay by Mary in a nursing home at Windermere. Isn't that's about $400 a day. So that's about $150,000 a year, right? So that adds up quick. So you can imagine the premium you have to pay for the policy that's going to cover that. There's one exception to that rule, and that is um, if Mary has a long-term care insurance policy that will pay a minimum of $125 per day for a minimum of two years, uh, and, she, and that policy is in effect when she goes into the nursing home, and if when she fills in her, her mass health application, she does not check the box that says, I want to return home, but rather says the check the box that says, I'm not returning home, right? In that case, the house is completely safe. She will qualify for mass health. The, the house is not countable. They will not put a lien on it, and they'll have no claim against her estate regarding the house. That's the protection she gets from that little tiny policy. Now, two things about that policy. If she had, a, actually three things. Uh, first, if she had a policy that was in existence prior to March 15, 1999, then the amount that it had to be paying was only $50 a day. $50 a day for two years, right? Amazingly. No matter how much the value of the house, this can be a million dollar house, protects all the house, right? And in Frank and Mary's case, that's not bad. I mean, because the house is half of their assets. For most people I find on Martha's Vineyard, the house is about two thirds of the assets, right? Because the house prices are so high, right? So. So, so it has to be those, those terms. So, and if it's really, so don't get rid of those old long-term care insurance policies, right? That, that's the, kind of the moral of the story. If you've got a house, you know, and your mom or somebody has got one of those old policies, just keep paying, because it's going to save the house. It's going to save the house. Second piece of trivia um, is that if that policy is dated after some date in 2013, and I don't know the, I don't know the date, um, the, the, there, was, the, there was this bizarre thing about these policies, and that is, as I had mentioned, you have to be, at the day you go to the nursing home, the policy has to be able to pay the nursing home $125 a day for two years. Now, many of these policies, not the old ones, but newer ones, had a, had a home care option. Most policies now have a home care option. And in my, at my Mass Health 101, I talked about the fact that actually that's, one of, to me, one of the most valuable features is the home care option. But if, you've used, if you have an older policy that's older than that 2013, and you use up so many of the days on home care that when you go to the nursing home, you have less than two years left on the policy, it's no good. So if you have a two-year long-term care insurance policy, and you used one day of it for home care, and the next day you went to the nursing home, the policy no longer protects the house. If the policy was dated before 2013, this created such an obvious injustice that our legislature changed the rule in 2013. As of that day, as to any new policy or any policy from that, that day going forward, as long as the policy originally gave you two years of care in the nursing home at that amount, even if you used it up, either in the nursing home or on home care, as long as it has at least one day left and hasn't expired because you've used the whole policy, you have to save one day. As long as it has one day left, the policy will save your house, right? One final piece about this, and I'm sorry I'm spending quite a bit of time because many of you may not have long-term care insurance, but like for you, those of you who do, this is a big deal, and there are these little traps for the unwary. Now, I'm going to go back to that final trap. For, the, for you to use one of these policies, when you, no matter how big the policy is, when you file that mass health application, you have to say, no, I'm not going to return home. I just had this case. A couple came in. That their mother had been, had, they, had nothing, they had nothing left. She had her condo. She had her condo. She was living in her condo. She was, you know, she was making ends meet. Then the mother needed, she fell, broke her hip, broke her hip. Went to the nursing home. So the son comes in now with the daughter-in-law, with his wife. And all, their only asset is the quarter of a million, the whole condo. But it's a quarter of a million dollars. It's a nice condo. Quarter of a million dollars. It's a medium condo. So, so, and they said, well, and we know there's nothing we can do to save this, you know, the condo, you know, so, we're, but, but we're trying to figure out, you know, whether, whether we can qualify or how the lien is going to work and all that stuff. And I said, so do you have any long-term care insurance policy? And she said, yeah, but it was like this, it was worth nothing. Oh, I said, it was one of those old policies. 
She said, yeah. I said, what year was it issued? And she said, I don't know. So she, and she had it. She had all of her files, right? So she pulls out the policy. It was 1998. I said, let me make your day, right? The condo is safe, right? There's going to be no lien on the condo. You get the condo. All you have to do is make sure when you file the application for Mass Health that you say that, you're not, that your, your mother-in-law is not intending to return home. She said, I already filed the application. I said, no, you filed it. I said, what did you put in that box? I mean, I knew. Because everybody puts in the box, we intend to return home. Because that way, you don't have to sell the real estate, right? So she pulls it out, and there it is. She, she, she pulled it out. I said, has your mother been accepted yet? She said, because she had filled, done it like four, 45 days before. about. And she said, I don't know. I said, you, you don't know? Right? I said, Do, have you gotten any mail? Have you gotten anything? She says, no, we, ha we haven't. What do we do? I said, we're going to file a withdrawal of that application right now, right? Got a thing, we had her sign, I drove to Tewksbury, which is kind of the regional office, and filed it and got a date stamped, and then got up my courage to ask a caseworker if she had been approved yet, if the mother-in-law had been approved yet. And she checked on the computer, she said, no, there must have been some kind of paperwork glitch or something, she hasn't been approved yet. So we saved the condo, right? We reapplied like two days later, but checked out the correct box. So, but, so that bot, you can't make that mistake. There's, for bizarre reasons, it, once she has been approved, you can't correct the error. You cannot correct this error, right? So make, pay attention to that. Um, so finally, if you're, you, you found any of this interesting, but well, I was talking too fast and you want to see it again, uh, it's, it'll be played on cable wonderfully. And also, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, uh, Elder Law Frank and Mary, so you can see this or any of the shows that we do here, and thank you for, and, and, and um, a, a lot of, I always say that, that most of my clients either are worried about Alzheimer's or have Alzheimer's or somebody they know has it. That's why they talk to me, right? And the best way for that problem to get solved, really, is with research to cause the symptoms of Alzheimer's, the dementia, to slow down. I've always told people, and I, I started doing this because my mother had Alzheimer's. My mother died in a nursing home in 1991. My, one of my older siblings just got a diagnosis, you know, and it's, and it's coming. You, can, you know, it's, this is me, you know, it's coming. Um, but maybe not for my kids, you know, maybe by then, you know. It, but the way to do that is research, and that's really what the Alzheimer's Association is all about. So if you can participate or donate, if you want, if you want to support Frank and Mary, we, they'd love a contribution, right? Uh, thank you. Any questions? And remember, that's the goal. The goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, and then you, ma'am, and then anybody else. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know in some of your earlier uh, presentations it made a difference, you know, what state you were in and everything, if, which happens often here. Yes. Somebody has a mother or mother-in-law or whatever in New York State or whatever, and when they move out of their home and into a nursing home, they put them in Massachusetts nearby. Yeah. Um, so that they can at least go visit and stuff. Is any of this stuff, I mean, Mass Health is federally funded, but it's still a Massachusetts. An excellent question. An excellent question. So, does it matter? Doesn't this vary from state to state? Absolutely, yes. These rules absolutely vary. And regarding some of these rules, like for example, regarding these early, these transfer rules be able to transfer things and immediately qualify by transferring to your spouse, that's not true in all states, right? There are a number of these things that are not true in all states. So you really want to, and so when you're doing your planning, your long-term planning, you want to think that out. I have a case in Martha's Vineyard where the, where the folks are here and really want to stay here. One spouse is pretty sick, right? And if that spouse dies, the other spouse may stay here or may go back to with their children. One's in Connecticut, one's in New York, one's in New Jersey, right? So as part of the planning, you needed to check the rules in Connecticut and the rules in New York and the rules in New Jersey, just to see first if as a documentation matter, you could make the document, tweak the documents to work as well as possible. And then also to see if there was something you just cross out, right? But then, more as a kind of a crisis matter, once again, you should understand that. If your mother is in New Jersey, I had one of those, right? So if your mother is in New Jersey, and all her life, and her house is in New Jersey, and then she moves to Massachusetts to Windermere. The day she gets to Windermere, provided maybe someone has a power of attorney to sign for her, if she says, it's my intention to be a Massachusetts resident, she's in, boom. And all the rules regarding all of her assets are all the Massachusetts rules. 
right? And conversely, I got somebody where the daughter is in Texas, and they're, they're eventually going to go to why they would ever move from Martha's Vineyard to Texas. I don't get it. But there they are. They are. You know, they must really love that daughter, right? So, but, but so, you know, we've you, you got to know the Texas rules. If that's where you think, you may end up, like, in assisted living because you're close to your daughter, and therefore, if you, and if you need long-term care, you, you want to know, you want to think about that ahead of time. Did that answer that question? I think okay. so, yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, if my husband has access, uh, has access, he can transfer him anytime he wants to access, transfer him to me? Not you just want to clarify that because you're finding this hard to believe, right? Because you've yes. always been told you got to <laughs> transfer everything out and wait five years. <laughs> exactly right. I, inevitably, clients will talk to me and they'll say, you know, Mr. Bergeron, this is just totally different from what everybody else has told me. Why is it? I said, I don't know. I don't know why they haven't told you. That is correct. In Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, if he, if he needed nursing home care to, I don't know if I'm pointing at the right guy, right? So I don't want to be putting him on the spot. <laughs> if your, uh, excuse me, if your husband needed to qualify for Mass Health, uh, and you and he was in the Frank and Mary situation, he could transfer all your assets to you in day one, and then if he was, if if he needed to qualify for the frail elder waiver, he could qualify immediately, because your assets don't count at all. If he needed nursing home care, then in day two, you'd have to go buy that annuity in order to get your cash below the magic number, right? But on day three, he could qualify for mass health with no advanced planning at all. Similarly, if, if you were worried about protecting your husband because he had Alzheimer's, I had this situation, right, where people came in really stressed, right? There's a husband and a wife and a daughter. It's the whole family, right? And the wife's got cancer, and she's really bummed out because the husband's got early stage Alzheimer's. She's been taking care of him. So now she's in the hospital. The daughter comes to me. We're going to get killed. My, my, my mother's going to die. Dad's going to have to spend on all the money, right? Because he's going to go, because she's not going to be there to care for him. And I said, no problemo here. All we're going to do is we're going to change your mother's will so that your mother's will says when I die, everything goes in trust. We did in trust with the daughter as the trustee for the husband's benefit. And the same day, we just shifted all the assets. And the mother died two weeks later, right? And the dad's now in the nursing home three years later. And there was a million dollars, and it was all safe, right? And that was, you can do that last minute. You can, because it's Massachusetts, some other places you can't do something. But else. only if you have a spouse. Oh, yeah. Some, yeah, if you're, if you're married, if you're just married, you've got this, you've got this five-year issue. The only way around the five issue is get married. But that's a big, that's a, <laughs> that's, that's really biting a tough, that's a bullet, you know, that you got to, right? But, you know, if it's Martha's Vineyard, right? If you, you want to stay on Martha's Vineyard, yes, ma'am. If we have other health insurance, is that anything, are the, they related? The question is, is MassHealth related to other insurance? The answer is no. Uh, health, health insurance, except for other long-term care insurance. Health insurance, is, health insurance is, covers the cost of getting better, right? And, and Medicare is simply health insurance for the old. So you had health insurance while you were younger. I'm talking about my regular, like, everyday health insurance. Right, health insurance. Health insurance does not cover the cost of staying the same, only the cost of getting better. So, for example, medic, if, you, if you are in a, nurse, a skilled nursing facility, right, and you're there because you stayed in the hospital, you got sick, right, and, and there's a definition of sick, three days, admitted to the hospital for three days. Make sure you get admitted, even if you thought you were admitted because you were sleeping in one of their beds. But if you weren't admitted for the three days, when you get to the nursing home, Mass Health isn't pay or Medicare is not paying, right? Because you weren't sick, right? But even if you were sick, you get, when you get to the to the nursing home, Medicare will pay for up to 100 days in the nursing home because you're there to get better. So as soon, so they'll only pay for up to 100 days. As soon as the medic nursing home says um, she doesn't need skilled services anymore, right? Oh, you're off Medicare. Right? So the average Medicare-funded stay in a nursing home is 17 days. It's not 100 days. Right? After that day, regarding as far as Medicare is concerned, and I'll guarantee you any other health insurance policy, you're done. Right? You're on private pay because you're not getting better. That's the point at which, and, unless you're on MassHealth. MassHealth is the only program, insurance program, that has as one of its benefits long-term care. 
It's, it is an insurance program because it covers everything else too. It covers hospitals and all that jazz, right? Are any of these, these uh, benefits, can you use any of these benefits you've been talking about if, you, if you're not insured by MassHealth for your health insurance? Can you use any of these benefits? No. The, the, only, the, only, pro the only government program that will pay for home care, right, or that will pay for custodial care, care because you need to be in a place where you're safe, right, but you don't need regular interventions by a nurse or a physical therapist or another skilled person as Medicare defines it, right? The only government program that will pay for those things is MassHealth. That's why it's so important. It's, it's a whole, so I'll do my, I, I have a few more minutes, so I'm just gonna say, this is my soapbox here, you know, this is, this is a hole in the system. Whenever people tell me, oh, I feel morally terrible that I'm doing all this stuff so I can qualify for mass health. I'll tell them, I say, well, you know, this is just a result of a political decision. When Lyndon Johnson proposed Medicare, a wonderful thing, and by the way, the thing about Medicare to remember, I, you see, we're getting old, so we don't kind of remember the, the old days, right? When Medicare passed, 34% of all elders were poor. Now this was 30 years after Social Security was passed. 34%. That number today is 7%, right? Because people went poor because they got sick. They got sick and they, they, their health insurance was dropped and they went broke, right? And Medicare changed that for everything except Alzheimer's, right? Any time, if you're really sick, right? If you're really sick, you need a lot of help, chemo, surgery, blah, 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 right? Medicare will pay it all, right? If you need someone to help you put on your pants, oh no, we don't pay for that, that's not skilled enough, right? So, this, so Alzheimer's the, the, is the only major disease set which isn't covered. When, why? Because it was part of the original LBJ Medicare package and then their advi the advisors came in and said, we can't propose this, we're gonna get killed politically, it costs too much money, so they dropped it. And then when Obamacare was being developed, you know, ten, eight years ago, same thing happened. We should put this in. Yeah, except it's going to kill the program, right? We, get, we can't do it. So it's just this intentional hole in the program, right? And what, what I'm trying to do is patch the hole. The ultimate solution is this should be part of the program. But I don't think the Republicans are going to do that <laughs> in the near future. So I think we've got to kind of keep working with this. Okay, does that answer your I didn't mean to sound as if that was politically colored. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Just as a follow-up to that one, though, if, if you're on a regular uh, Blue Cross and, you know, yeah. Medix plan and Medicare or something like that, right. you would presumably have some life event or diagnosis that would cause you to have a change in status so that you needed to become eligible for Medicaid mass health instead? Well, so, it, it, you know, so how the, the question, how would me, you transmit? Well, let me put it this transition. way. When, when, you, when you become, the question is, do you, do, if you're on Medicare, does it like this come kind of a medical thing that happens that causes you to be now on mass health? No, there's simply something that happens that causes you to be not on Medicare, right? So when you're on mass health, you're staying on Medicare. And if while you're at the nursing home, or at home, because you're getting these other things, you need to go to the hospital, Medicare's paying, right? Until you get better again, in which case Medicare stops paying and now you're back on mass health or you're back, or you're back on private pay. So Medicaid, Medic, mass health, which is once again the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, because those rules do vary by state by state. So since the rules, Jerry, they get the name of a different thing too. So there's like Cal Care and there's like Ohio Care and there's all these right. So, th so th there are these kind of two separate things, but but once again, it's just Mass Health will pay. Mass Health will pay for all medical events in addition, but no other medical insurance will also pay for the cost of taking care of you if you don't need skilled care. Okay, that kind of the, the essence of it. So, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. We're going to have two programs in the fall. We'll see you then. And in the meantime, if you have any suggestions, let me know or email me. You've got all my information. Okay, and thank you very much. We'll see you in the fall. Thank you.